You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Hello, readers, and welcome back to another week of the Batuta Advocate radio show here on Desert Rock FM. Yes, thank you for tuning in for another week with myself, Clancy Overall, and fellow editor of the Batuta Advocate, Errol Parker. Yes, hello, everyone. Yes, it's been a busy week up here in the Channel Country for us, and we're capping it off now talking to a famous Queen Bee Knight. Queen Bee Knight, Queen Bee Knees, perhaps. We'll have to check up on that one, but we do have a famous Australian from one of the interstate appendages of Canberra here in the studio today. Yes, there have been a surprising number, a disproportionate amount of notable Australians from Queanbeyan. Uh, there's David Campese, who famously went to a public school and somehow managed to get a start with the Wallabies. Captain, wasn't he? He was the captain. He was uh, there on the wing, I think he was. He scored many tries, led the Wallabies to the 1991 World Cup victory. That is an anomaly in, in that particular sporting code. Then, of course, you have George Lazenby, the only Australian to play James Bond. Uh, which is, is quite a claim. He was also a model and a professional golfer at one point. And then, of course, Ricky Stewart, the coach with the best entertainment value in the NRL and a confirmed uh, problematic, perhaps, habit of chasing wooden spoons. Yeah, well, he's never coached the Newcastle Knights or the Titans, so I don't think he's got too many spoons in that drawer of his. And then there's another wallaby, Matt Gitto, who... Famously kicked the Wallabies to a 9-8 loss to Scotland in Murrayfield back in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he kicked so well that he only managed to kick one uh, that was from the sideline blowing, and he missed three right in front. And then, of course, Suzanne Blair. Uh, she's an Olympic gold medalist in the women's shooting, Clancy. Yes, yes, another famous Queen Bee Knees, Queen Bee Knight, Queen Bee Insider if you will. A lot of a lot of prominent people, mostly sport uh, sports stars, have come out of the New South Wales owned suburb of the ACT. Um, and it is it is renowned for uh, for providing the real world outside of the bowl of Canberra with a lot of entertainment. And there's surprisingly many more uh, that we haven't mentioned today, including the man we are about to speak to, Hal Ladukefu, who at one point could have been one of Queen Bean's famous sporting products, but instead chose the life of Australian hip hop royalty. Yeah, he runs a hip-hop show on Triple J for those listening at home or those listening at the Diamond Tina who might not have access to Triple J. He's got a 20-year career in, in the industry as both an artist and a record label executive, Clancy. Yes, he's done a lot in his time for the hip-hop, uh, Australian hip-hop culture and for the Polynesian community in the arts, uh, full stop. And he stopped here today in town to check out some emerging hip-hop talent in the Diamond Tina, uh, mostly from Batuta Ponds, but... Uh, you know, while he's on the lookout, we've invited him into the studio and he's agreed to have a chat with us. And he's going to talk to us about a whole manner of things today, he says, including, of course, the frosty relationship between Triple J and MC Cursor, who fired a shot on our podcast just a few short months ago. You might remember this. <laughs> yeah, we saw that one the other day of you. Someone threw a, a Triple J banner on stage. Yeah, no, nah, man, it was behind the sound guys oh, right. and the sound guy was spewing too, man. <laughs> it's, it's behind his head and I noticed it just before we went on stage and then... My mate's like, oh, I'll go take it down. They go, nah, I'll take it down after the first song. So, like, did first song and then, oh, there's a Triple J banner. Bring that here. Just ripped it up. The crowd went crazy, man. They, they know the backstory to it. There's no explaining. Yes, he's going to uh, explore that uh, relationship with the abrasive Campbelltown uh, hip-hop artist and uh, Aria chart-topping MC, Cursor, and much, much more. Uh, how Ladakefu, how are you, mate? I'm really good. Thanks for having me, man. We originally had plans of doing a cipher today with How, a rap <laughs> cipher, where Errol and I had actually been working on our stuff. But we thought, you know what, let's just uh, let's just have a flat out interview with Howie. Uh, Howie, what's been happening, mate? Everything, man. Uh, hectic times, but good times. Uh, you know, with, with a family and a few jobs under my belt, mm -hmm. keeps me on my toes. But I, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, I think it would have been the first. Uh, it was a cipher, you said? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think that would have been the first one we had here on this country rock radio station. I'll tell you what, you know, we've had we've had Curse through here, you know. He didn't offer to spit some bars, you know. it's It would have been nice, but, you know. Well, we did um, have on high rotation a couple of years ago, Tim McGraw fit Nelly. 
<laughs> which was, I guess, the classic close, yeah. country hip hop fusion we've had. That on must here. that must have been a bit before my time. Yeah, yeah. it, it might have been. Also, Florida Line did a song with Nelly as well. He's he's actually uh, quite a skirt. diverse artist. Diverse, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And speaking of diverse, uh, well, artists, but as well as just career wise, mm. Howie, you've you started. Um, as a MC producer at, a, at any point? MC, uh, yeah, I actually did produce a few tracks here and there. Um, but yeah, predom- uh, predominantly an MC. Mm-hmm. And that was out of Queen Bien? Out of Queen Bien. Coolest was, uh, was, the, was the band? Yeah. Well, I was actually born in Canberra, but then, you know, a few minutes after that, mm-hmm. straight back to 2620. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, stomping grounds of, of Canberra and met Daniel uh, around 90. 92 mm-hmm. and yeah from there we we formed various groups but ended up being coolism coolism yeah and so that for, for the listeners uh in the diamantina shire or around the country that uh, aren't familiar with this particular genre of australian uh i mean uh, the aria is called urban music but you, yeah. then again you just said you're from queenbian which is technically <laughs> yeah. rural new south wales <laughs> australian hip-hop which has yes. moved leaps and bounds and you mm. were obviously a pioneer in that in the early days um what were you up against just trying to be a rapper back when Silverchair was the most popular music? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the times people were like, what, you rap? You know, that you're not even American. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, I know some opera singers and country singers, they're not American or Italian either. Mm. So it was a lot of those arguments and it, a lot of it was dealing with our own identity. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously grew up listening to a lot of stuff from the UK and America and you start off rapping like an American, like your favorite American artist. But then you're like, you know what, we're Australian, let's use Australian slang, let's mm-hmm. talk about, you know, when I started rapping, I talked about playing rugby and, mm-hmm. and being Tongan, and mm-hmm. um, and it was just about that, really. And what, was the, what is the demographics of Queen being like, when you were a kid, anyway? There are a lot of, um, a lot of Kiwis, mm-hmm. a lot of Maori people there, a lot of, uh, as we, we call them, Macos. Uh, Macedonians. Yeah, Macedonians, yeah. Um, a lot of Italians. Um, that was it you know a, a handful of Asians as well you know predominantly white mm-hmm. um, but you know and, and you looked at Canberra and it was quite multicultural it wasn't like when my cousins grew up in Auckland or grew up in Sydney they, they were predominantly mixed with Islanders mm-hmm. whereas we were kind of forced to grow up with everyone which was was awesome lots of international babies in Canberra too like diplomats kids and all that <laughs> yeah, kind of shit yeah, yeah. growing up with mates from uh, you know, Venezuela to <laughs> Holland, <laughs> and uh, and and you. So from there, you were actually uh, charted with Coolism. You, you guys were on the charts, um, or was it was it more of an underground kind of thing? No, it was definitely an underground thing. You know, like Canberra was always well known for their DJs and mm-hmm. graffiti writers, mm-hmm. and I mixed up a lot of the graffiti writers and that whole culture. It's crazy, you know. A lot of a lot of fights, a lot of this and that, you know, a lot of stealing, a lot of racking, and you know, a lot of drugs and this and that. And I grew up with a lot of those guys, and they kind of taught me the ropes with a lot of things. Even though I didn't write, I was a rapper. And then I'd come up to Sydney and mix up with people from West Ride and those sort of areas, and they were heavy in the streets. And so I grew up with a lot of those guys, but I was more like, you know, I I rap and I play r- rugby, mm-hmm. you know, and. I was mixing up with them, but and it was exciting. But I was more the music thing where they were in the those other things, mm-hmm. street things. So you're playing league or union down there? Union, man, rugby union. union, of course. Mm-hmm. I, I did play league school and and for one year outside of school. One year I played league and union. You know, back in those days mm-hmm. where you could back up the next day, like yeah, I feel good. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna play another Saturday, game. Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah gone other days. Um, and did that ever look like a thing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, there was a time where, you know, I was playing. I was playing at not a bad level. We we had a team in the New South Wales competition mm-hmm. back then. It was called Canberra Kookaburras. So I was playing Colts then. At that time, I was like, you know what? I'll I'll, I'll give this a crack. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to play for the Wallabies or Plan B, play for Tonga. Mm-hmm. And and then the music started taking off, and 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 I just chose music to you know. To my father's dismay, but yeah. you know he understood after a few years later. Um, but yeah, rugby has always been a big thing. Yeah, I mean not only for myself, but you know my dad and my uncles and all the relatives in Tonga. So did your family come via New Zealand, or was that nah, just cousins over there? 
No, no. Uh, my uncle came to Canberra to go to uni. Right. In sort of the late 60s, early 70s. And then he brought over his brothers mm-hmm. and, and some other boys from the same village, which included my wife's dad. Really? So um, they all came at the same time, and my uncle was like setting them up. And said, "Okay, you're gonna be a mechanic, you're gonna be a painter, you're gonna be an electrician, you're gonna be a draftsman." And then they set up shop, and then whenever anyone needed something, they just hollered at the other. Form their own com- uh, economy, it. It's really. Like mafia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <Tom and> mafia. <laughs> the, 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 the tradesman, mafia tradesman. Yeah. And this podcast, Errol, is brought to the listeners by a company who won't charge you money after you die. No, they're not like some of our other esteemed financial companies who've made a bit of a habit of ripping people off. Even when they're dead, yes. It's a, it's a rare thing, but people like this do exist, and they're a nice little investment app called Raise. They'll help you save by taking small amounts of everyday money from transactions and investing it into a portfolio just for you. That's right, Errol. If you spend $4.80 on an extra-large flat white at a drive through in Brisbane, Raise will skim the 20 cents off that transaction and place it into a fund and invest it for you. So get around Raise, spelled R-A-I-Z, if you want a financial company that skims money to help you save, rather than skims money to line their own pockets in the hope a royal commission doesn't come along and out them. Like any investment, Raise carries normal market risk, so make sure you read the product disclosure statement. Okay, cool. So, so when did that? When did you start going on tour, and was that a shock to the system? Yeah, definitely, because especially at that time, mm-hmm. you know, there was no infrastructure, there was no industry for us. It, no one believed in in hip hop being made in Australia, um, and so you, I would travel from Queen Bee to Sydney for shows. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. play for like twenty people, or whatever. But that twenty people were passionate yeah. people at they that were the time. Real fans, yeah, they, they were really in it for love and for the culture of things. And even that was really exciting. Like, oh wow, we're gonna go to a show and they're gonna pay us fifty dollars to do this. Like, mm-hmm. oh awesome. And I just remember. The first time we got paid to travel interstate, our first interstate show was Adelaide. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, that was the first time I met the Hoods mm-hmm. as well. And because um, you'd hear about people like, oh, wow, yeah, these guys. So the, the Hilltop Hoods were uh, kind of pioneers as well, I yeah, guess, no, in the other side of the country. Yeah, definitely. You know, there, there were in each state, in each territory, there were, you know, a few people doing it. And, and at that time, it was internet wasn't even popping like that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. one of our friends had a mobile. <laughs> you know, it was that time, and um, street press. That's yeah, what street through. press was a big thing. You know, mm-hmm. and um, the only way you'd find out about something, and no one had videos, mm-hmm. music videos. Yeah, for sure. And so the only time you'd hear about someone is when you went to a record store, and then the guy working at the record store would be like, "Hey, have you heard of these guys? They're from Melbourne. They made this." And you're like, "Oh, wow!" And so when you went to Melbourne or when they came to wherever. And you'd see him like, oh, is that so-and-so over there? And that's how you met people. So Adelaide was our first interstate show. And I remember turning to Daniel on the the plane like, man, can you you believe this? Like people were actually paying us, paying for the flight Mm. and then paying us to perform. It was was quite a moment and it was quite overwhelming. And then from there, you know, different states and then national tours. And yeah, it was crazy. How do you think Adelaide uh, ended up as being the epicenter of of early Australian hip hop? Mm. Australia's Atlanta. I know, Australia. it's very you know, hot. Atlanta. The hilltops were basically, mm. you know, our outcasts, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I just think they just had a, a strong community over there. You know, yeah. they had Certified Wise, which was a crew that Hilltop Hoods would spearhead, and but they also had Funkors and they had Vents and they had. Um, after hours and all these other groups, and I think they just had a strong collective. They were all um, strong in their in their own right, and they just moved as a as a um, collective. It wasn't and too clicky either. Was that? Or was that hard for you to break into the Adelaide world? Or no, no, really. That was the, the that was the beauty of being from from Queen Bean because Queen Bean Canberra wasn't really known for hip hop artists, and so wherever we went, we went. Um, as these other guys. Uh, yeah, as yeah. these other guys. And we were always welcome because we weren't involved in any politics, yeah. inner city politics or even kind of big city politics. Yeah. Like yeah. back then, if Sydney and Melbourne was like, yeah. cla- I mean, it's always clashing. But it, yeah, it was like that. People would think, oh, okay, these guys are almost like, 
uh, like neutral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we'd get along with everyone else too. And plus, I was tall, you know, and I was like, he was bigger back then. And, you know, <laughs> no one messed with <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you weren't like a a skinny guy wearing a like a peaked, <laughs> peaked beanie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, French hey. popping out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, obviously, your old man would have to have been happy with how that turned out because if you look at mm. the state of professional sports at the moment, <laughs> going on tour as a footballer in any code would result in more trouble than a, yeah. a hip hop. Well, you know, it wouldn't be too bad because there was no mobile phones and social media. So, you know, I stayed on field. Actually, you know, I was stayed well, went on tour. I was actually stayed on tour. Yeah, um, yeah and, and of all the stuff that's happened in the rugby league, and mate. Like, in the off season, I mean, you haven't heard a peep out of the union boys. I mean, like the last thing that I remember hearing about a rugby union boy acting up was uh, the halfback Nick Phipps. He he pissed on a bar down there in Sydney in Woolhara in a private function. Like it, it was his bucks party, and and well, God Stand. forbid he he had a piss somewhere other than the urinal, <laughs> and, and that was in the newspapers. I, I mean, know. he didn't it was, even. It wasn't I mean, in the newspapers for long I though. Mean, <laughs> was in uh, was like, the village like, voice down in the Woolhara? He didn't even piss in his own mouth. It was yeah. just on the floor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was quite timid. Yeah, yeah. in comparison. Well, and there's oh, not, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, like, cur- you know, Curly Bill had a few oh, yeah, incidents, Cur- and Cur- um, he's done his best to be in as many videos as possible. He was just. <laughs> and our old mate a, um, he used to play the fullback Curly Bill's good friend young uh, kid and he was an awesome player but then he just mucked up too many times yeah. went to Europe and Quaid nah nah nah, nah. O'Connor? young blonde O'Connor. yeah O'Connor O'Connor. Yeah. O'Connor. O'Connor got caught with a bag yeah yeah yeah. but you know he he was done the moment he, he goes you know I'm just trying to do what's best for the James O'Connor brand <laughs> it's like mate don't say that <laughs> don't please, ever say that don't say that in a post match interview for the Wallabies please <laughs> but um, it, it is a bit like that the rugby union guys though there's been no leaks because as it is well known that rugby union players only have um, sex to procreate and uh, and <laughs> yeah. they don't and they don't film so <laughs> and they main and they always have to maintain eye contact <laughs> when they're having sex yeah, they need to. <laughs> even if it's like it's, it's, it's like you know even if actually I should just stop yeah now. pull up pull up <laughs> well, actually I, I remember when things were happening like that back in the days and someone I think it might have been Fitzy or something said um. The difference is the, rope, the union boys say thank you afterwards. You know? oh, right <laughs> but I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, obviously, it's happening everywhere, but there is something really yeah. bad in that league yeah, culture. That's well, that, there's, well, that's the, also, this is the exactly. first time we've seen millennials who've grown up with iPhones. This yeah. is the first time yeah, we've seen what happens there. Like, you know, but, yeah. It's one thing to whip it out and film it. It's another thing to put it up in a fucking public forum like... Yeah. Like yeah. a WhatsApp group that's full of people. You got no like like Jaded there could be footballs. yeah yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> like pull your head in. Uh, it's just, the worst. Just, it's just horrible, a bit of man. common sense. You know, and there's just I mean, obviously there are some some contributing factors. Social media, you know, access to porn, like how easy it is, and and no kind of monitoring at, whatsoever. But you know, there there's, has to start somewhere. Just respect. Yeah, you know, yeah. like respect for a female, respect for a fellow human being. It's 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 messy. Now back, but like uh, that that is a good lead into where you're at now. Where you're, <laughs> where, where you're at. You got something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a good lead into where you're at now. Is where you're looking for talent, and you know, mm. uh, aside from football, you're looking for talent <laughs> in hip hop. Yeah, and and I can imagine some of these blokes you're meeting might be a bit volatile and might need a little <laughs> bit of guidance. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it's all walks of life, but um. Yeah. Um, but you know, hip hop's that culture. You yeah. know, it comes from the street yeah, essentially, yeah. And, and a lot of people connect. A lot of young uh, uh, artists connect with with things that are violent and things yeah. that are from the streets. And, and and it is what it is, as yeah. they say. But it's it then it's like okay, well, this is your life now. Yeah. But at some point, you're gonna have to evolve mm-hmm. as an artist and as a man. Mm-hmm. So that's where I feel I come in is to kind of nurture that talent. But also, just give them options. Like, okay, cool. We want to stick with the street shit. You know where that's going. You have friends and family mm-hmm. dead or junkies or yeah. they're in jail. Yeah. You can call, you can go that way. Or with music, that could potentially open more doors, do shows, tour, you know. 
Oop. keep you out of the can. What one thing we're saying with with hip hop in Australia is it actually has, and, and this would be an interesting one for you, for you of all people to kind of watch because you were you've kind of walked in both worlds between the mainstream and this underground, mm-hmm. which is getting more and more kind of grimy and kind of you know um, street, mm-hmm. as you said. Uh, what what if, what was your thinking when like the the charting kind of hip hop in Australia was kind of more about barbecues and you know going to festivals and stuff like that. <laughs> As someone who obviously grew up listening to rap yeah, from all over the world, yeah. um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like hip hop in Australia gets unfair rap about. It. It's always about barbecues. Now. There, there is, you know, obviously there is. And hey, who doesn't like a barbecue? Yeah. To be honest, um, but I understand. You know, there, there, there is it's some the worst, stuff. It's that, the buzzword that people use. Yeah, I know, I know. It kind of annoys me at the same time, but at the same time, I, I do understand. Um, but yeah, that's why it's so exciting now, especially the last four years. Is it? It, it was uh, the breath of fresh air we so sorely needed. Mm-hmm. You know, because for a while, yeah. when the hoods blew up, we felt like yes, we've done it. One of our own has done it, and then they kind of created this. Thing and it was like, oh shit, it's not exactly where I thought we needed to go yeah. as a culture, as yeah. music. But then, you know, a lot of people that felt they couldn't connect with that movement or felt outcasted from movement, like, you know what, fuck it, let's go do our own thing. And yeah. that's when things started getting exciting. And social media, like, you know, for all the uh, negatives uh, that we just mentioned, <laughs> has done wonders for like artists across all genres, obviously. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of people. Um, a lot, of, a lot of pop stars have made their name through through yeah, YouTube, through YouTube yeah. SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah. I saw an interview the other day. You know, the uh, the Arctic Monkeys were here. Um, <laughs> uh, they were, you know, that they just did a tour of this country, and they said that they owed a lot of their early success to LimeWire. Yeah, 100%. and and the fact that people were like pirating the hell out of their music, <laughs> and then you know that's how word spread. Yeah, you know? definitely. You know, because a lot of these countries wouldn't have access to CDs and mm-hmm. things of that nature. And, you know, um, it's like, <laughs> and it's kind of a tangent, but Soldier Boy, when he first started making music, he would upload his music to LimeWire, but would name it 50 Cent in the club. So when people <laughs> started downloading it, it was like a Soldier Boy song. I'm like, what the fuck? And then people would be like, oh, no, this actually slaps. <laughs> well, that's why he, that's why he made, made sure to mention his name in every verse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Soldier Boy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, social media has been, I mean, it's Catch-22, isn't it? In yeah. The whole internet thing. But it definitely, for the better, has allowed... Um, Hip hop artists of, of all genres, all sub genres, to connect with pockets of people around the world. Yeah, you know, with, without having to go through the traditional gatekeepers or, or labels, mm-hmm. and um, and it's it's been awesome. But at the same time, there's no real quality control. Yeah, you know, it's like wild <laughs> west out there. Like someone and and hip hop is, is world you know, star is right. <laughs> wild star is at, is at that point where it doesn't take much to to write a hip hop song. You know, mm-hmm. if you have the program, you just record it, and then you can just straight away upload it to SoundCloud, and it just sounds like they recorded a song through a toaster. It's mm-hmm. like, <laughs> but at the same time, there is a kind of charm about that. Yeah, yeah, know? the the kind of rough. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that kind of energy is like, you know, before it gets filtered, mm-hmm. and then polished, and then put out in the world. It's like, yeah. Now we we've interviewed David Lepepe and um, and Jochi from Gang of Youths, yeah. and they're uh, a big point they made actually when they won Album of the Year uh, in their speech beautiful, was beautiful uh, speech. yeah it was about how um, you know Islanders in Australia are, are now you know it, it's 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 a conversation everyone's having that you know you can be diverse in what mm. you do when you when you leave school and that kind of stuff, and they would I guess you'd say the most high profile. Polynesian rockers in the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the states, but definitely in Australia. Yeah. Um, have, have you kind of seen that as well in the, in the public eye? The the kind of the, the talent yeah. of, um, of yeah. you know PI Australians shining through. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I don't know it goes both ways. You know, when you when you grow up in the 80s and 90s, you know, there's only certain things that you could do as a Pacific Islander. You can play football go stand outside of a door and be security or work council. And, you know, when your parents come from, you know, it goes for all ethnicities. When the parents come from overseas to Australia for a better life or more opportunities, they don't want to hear that you want to be a musician. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah. like, man, we came over here. We want you to be a doctor or something. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of like, okay, we, we just need to do what we can do to make money. Mm-hmm. And um, But 
I think with the new generations, they're starting to see like, oh, what we can we can be creatives. Yeah. Even for me to be a rapper was, was, was you know, and for me to chase that dream it was a hurdle. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, my uncles be like, oh, that's, you know, yeah. that there's no future in that. Which you know, I can understand because at that point there really was none. And yeah. my parents, being the beautiful, loving parents that I have. Was supportive, but at the same time, they're like, "Well, you got to have something else to fall back on." <laughs> they had things set up just to yeah. Is that is that already bought his wallaby kit? Like, well, I have just bought his wallaby kit for nothing. Um, but yeah, and and in recent years, it's been awesome that Pacific Islanders are you know being able to do whatever they they feel like they want without pressure from church or pressure from their parents. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, it, it's a you know you kind of inherit this feeling of not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting to, to be different. But now I, f- I feel that, that there's confidence growing in, in the younger generations. And and there is, uh, in the Australian hip-hop scene, a, a bigger presence as well. It's not mm. just Howie anymore. <laughs> uh, the Triple One. Oh, no, sorry, not Triple One. Don't want to mix that one up. <laughs> one Four is your most recent um, mm. kind of... You spotted those guys? What what happened there? Yeah, Turquoise Prince. Shout out to Turquoise Prince as yeah. well. Queenbian. Queen Queenbian. Well, so that's uh, another story. But uh, arguably, if he wants to claim, it's all right. His old man was from there, so you know he's, he's got a right. Uh, you know, feel fresh. There's, there's a there's a lot. Um, but yeah, one four boys. No, nah, they because they were already doing their thing. Mm-hmm. You know, by the time I saw them, they were already on like hundred plus thousand views. Yeah. And so you're looking at it like, wow, this is crazy and you know i got involved because i could see that there's so much potential there but they they just didn't have the focus or dedication to commit to having a a, i guess a career in music you know they're heavy in the streets and um yeah you know and one of them is is locked up and one just came out you know it's a, a lot happening and without any kind of guidance um it can just not go where it should go mm-hmm. and I think um, because I, I I never had any kind of like my OGs were street guys mm-hmm. you know I didn't have anyone in the music industry where I could reach out to because we were trying to figure that shit out ourselves mm-hmm. and so me being the, having the experience that I have I've taken it upon myself to reach out to the young generation and say look like what you're doing if you need any advice or feedback I'm, I'm here and, you know and I think that's important to have with the younger generation and and with those guys, that's what I did. I said, "Look, if this is what you really want to do, then let's meet and let's let's talk and let's try and plan." And 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 that's what that's what's happened. Uh, uh, so, what capacity are you working in in that role? Is it you're with a with a label? Um, I do have a label. You you have a label. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an imprint uh, um, of Sony, and it's called Forever Ever. And um, with these guys, at the moment, I'm just like a mentor, mm-hmm. which I am with with a lot of young artists it's just being there and because they're going to make mistakes and they should make mistakes that's how you learn but then my job is to alleviate as many mistakes as possible um, and that's like you know keeping those guys on the outside mm-hmm. um, as well as you know other artists is, when they're talking to people that are approaching them from that want to manage or want to sign them it's just like well let's talk about it this pros and cons blah 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 and um, yeah, I love being one of those, you know, old, older statesmen, elder statesmen, and um, just being able to offer offer that advice and and time and and knowledge. Now you you have had the hip hop show on Triple J since about well, ten years now. Yeah, this is the eleventh year. Eleven yeah, years, crazy. Right. Yeah, and even before that, Maya had it for two years. Yeah, and then Nicole Foot, which was she was the first host. I think she may have had it for two years as well. Now, do you think that the you know you record later in the evening? Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think some of the young lads that you bring in there for live ciphers and stuff might rattle the uh, everyday ABC employee down there at Old yeah. Time? We've seen a couple of those ciphers. And yeah, like, well, you know, it's, it's it's recorded late at night, so everyone's at home, snug in bed. So, um, but when I yeah, it is interesting because because in the ABC building, obviously we have Triple J, but then you have National Radio, and then you have. You know, Everyone, a lot of suits yeah. in there yeah, as well. So when, suits. you know, I had um, one of the latest interviews I did was with A Boogie with a hoodie. You know, he's from the Bronx and he just has like the same amount of jewelry as like Migos, yeah. you know. And he's just like walking through the 
Foyer and everyone's just like, who the hell is this kid? You know, he's only like young kid. I think he made early 20s. Yeah. And just glowed up and he's just, yeah. But at the same time, people are excited by it. Christine Milne. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's in the bum bag, lad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like I said, you know, because people, they live a certain life and it's just intriguing. So my wife, she, she owns her own business and marketing and she has a very corporate lifestyle. And then when we head out to things, people want to talk to me because I'm just so foreign to their life yep. and it's intriguing yeah. oh, when it's you the, go to the corporate the, the yeah. corporate plus one yeah and they start <laughs> yeah. asking about music and artists yeah, yeah. and I'm like oh yeah yeah, yeah we've all been there before how are yeah you? <laughs> I know you can relate yeah. <laughs> when I put my jewellery on and head out to the regional <laughs> yeah. news like functions <laughs> pull up in your race yeah, <laughs> yeah. now um so w- what can you see happening what are some big names that everyone who's listening who might you know kind of be brushing up on all their knowledge uh furiously now on their um iphones and all the names we're dropping who, who else can you tell people to look out for man you uh, know, get, uh, unless you've got a verse coming up on someone's album or you've got your own <laughs> hot 16 um no there's plenty like i mentioned phil fresh he i think he's gonna have an exciting year he often travels around with kwami and kwami's having a great year as well um there's this young 16 year old girl from gold coast called hoodsy mm. I think she's going to be something right. to watch out for as well. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's a lot, you know, and probably when I leave, I'll, I'll remember a whole heap more. It's like people say, oh, what are you listening to now? And I'm like, uh, mm, the... so <laughs> off, off the top of my head, yeah, those two are going to be going to be exciting. And, and I'm excited for Hoodsy because we really need, like, female energy out here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of test, t- testosterone flying around and mm-hmm. too much of that is not healthy, so... Yeah, it'd be good to see her do her thing. Um, anything? Uh, there's a particular sound coming out of Western Sydney, um, which is a bit more of a, a look that you actually don't see anywhere else in the world, which is the the, the Nordica and the bum bag. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. That kind of vibe. Is that, is that in itself, are there different kind of uh, chasms around the country, different kind of bubbles in, in that you're seeing? I mean, you, you, like you said, coming from Queanbeyan is probably the best place to be placed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. looking, looking out to the country yeah um yeah there are a lot of pockets and in, in different types you know sub genres you, you know you get a lot of uh west sydney crew which is in- interesting i have my, my nephew come out from new zealand and they're starting to listen to a lot of those guys like yeah. one four hooligan hefts um pistol pete and enzo and they're starting to dress like them yeah right, and use their eshe and itswa, and <laughs> so it's it's interesting because um, yeah, West, West Sydney's always been quite influential, but I don't think it, they've been given the love that they deserve. But now everyone's like, oh, West Sydney, and then it's going out to the world. So um, yeah, it's it's an interesting time, but it's great. Yeah, no, it's it's it, it's always been interesting to have a look at the aria charts at the end of the year. I mean, you've got you know. Obviously, it's Christmas time, so you've got, you know... Michael Bublé. Michael Bublé, <laughs> M- M- Mariah Carey, and Cursor. John Legend just went, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all up there like that. But do, do you think now that that the country and indeed the world has has gone to shit, <laughs> that the things that Cursor and, and, all, and all people like and what they rap about is, has become less abrasive than, say what mm. Powderfinger was going on about <laughs> like 20 years ago being like, you know, just looking at a sunset and strumming my guitar. <laughs> mm. um, I don't know. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe people are just more open to hearing about it. Yeah. Or people are more interested because, you know, West Sydney has traditionally been looked down upon, you yeah. know, like hardworking and or like kind of, Bogans or Gronks or just, whatever. Yeah. Um, mm. um, so I think people are just more, well, the new, newer generations anyway, are just more open to hearing what's happening out there. Cause, and it's exciting. You know, I live out in the East and I'll tell you, there's not much popping out there besides. Thought you'd be happy I made it. Hey, hey yeah. <laughs> well, you know, exactly yeah. that, you know. I, I love it out there actually, but yeah, it's kind of bland compared to when you head out West and mm-hmm. there's like, culturally diverse and for a gig at an rsl or something out yeah there. you know yeah. at panthers yeah, you yeah. know 
Yeah. Um, yeah after the cool. roast and mm. hit the open mic. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, um, the wet counter meal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've heard of, I've heard a fair bit of rap come out of the Blue Mountains down there in Sydney. That's, mm. it, that's well, Blue it's Mount- an odd part of the world. I mean, it's just not, not really, man. Like Blue Mountains have deep history. You know, uh, Hermitude from there, Earth Boy, uh, Dielectrics. There's a lot of great artists have come there, but had to move to Sydney mm-hmm. yeah. in order to make things happen. Um, but I, I'm thinking Blue Mountain is kind of like Queenbian, you know, you just mm. isolate it, so you just work on. Yep. Yeah, it's on, come on a long way from being uh, the member there uh, in Blacksland some thirty odd years ago was Paul Keating. You know, they have come a long way from. <laughs> yeah. you know, from and oh, it's mad freezing out there. It's at like Queenbian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like yeah, a lot like the the bowl that you kind of come from. Where- <laughs> God damn, it gets cold in Oh, camera. mate. We used to, I used to leave the studio at 3 o'clock in the morning and we'd have to scrape the ice off the windscreens. Yeah. Yeah, when I lived down there, I, I, I had a tape deck uh, that was the very best of the Eagles that I just used to scrape all the ice off the windscreen with. Like. So he just placed it on top because it was so hot and it was just like, <laughs> he missed it. Now, it's one thing we, we should talk about is Cursor because mm. he has obviously been a big part, almost a pioneer of a new wave. No, definitely. 100%. Uh, Eshe kind of, uh, you know, Western Sydney sound. and, and But also not all sound, but a very, like a DIY yeah. um, attitude. Yeah. And, he's, and, he, and it's kind of undeniable now for especially like music executives mm. who – Probably were given the heads up on him five years ago, and and then now it's now he's kind of dismissed that world, and he's making his money off touring and and selling CDs. Yeah. People are buying his CDs. Which... Don't forget the cursor uh, bikinis. Oh really? Cursor yeah. bikinis. He's got sold some real out. merch. Yeah, he sold them yeah. out. Yeah. Wow. And now he's teamed wow. up with well, Nautica's teamed up with yeah. him as well, which was a huge thing for for everyone, Massive. I guess. Massive. A sponsorship for for a hip hop artist. Mm. What, what what? When did you first see that? And did you see anything like like when you first saw what he was doing? Did you ever see the potential for that, or did you think it was just another one of those kids that could have been, you know, a flash in the pan? Well, well, I, no, I definitely saw it because that when I first saw him, like years ago, he was already on like hundred thousand views. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Fuck, who's this?" Yeah. You know, because I hadn't heard of him. But my my crew out that way were like, "Nah, it's Cursor." You know, he's like king out yeah. there. And I was like, "Wow!" And when I first met him, you know, Cursor and I have had bit of words on social media. Um, but when I first met him, I said, "Um, I truly appreciate your hustle and what you've done to get this far without any kind of support from radio or TV." But I just, for myself, I just couldn't connect with some of the songs. Because yeah. at that time, too, it was making a lot of kind of dancey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tra- like almost house kind of tracks. Yeah. And I was like, I'm trying to find something to play on the show, but I'm personally not connecting with it. But that's not saying that that won't happen. And he was like, yeah, cool, cool I get that. He has a very fuck Triple J attitude, which is fine. Mm. I mean, a lot of people have that attitude, and that's fine too. But when you say fuck Triple J, you're essentially saying fuck me too. Mm. So I kind of feel like... And then when I pull up people, they're like, oh, I'm not talking about you. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, but when you say it, other people... We're talking about Ben and Liam. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and... um, and, and, Lewis Hobber. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and you know, I played his uh, songs on the show, and he's been on my show twice. And, you know, he's kind of, you know, I've seen, I've heard a lot, you know, the interviews didn't hear, and I, I, you know, I read a lot of his interviews, a lot everyone's interviews, because I'm just a rap nerd, mm. and I just like to see what people's doing, you know. And he's kind of conveniently left out that he's been on my show with Forte to talk about one of his albums. I think it was maybe the Scott album. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's not anything, but it's just like. Come on, man. Yeah. What what you're saying? You you've been on the show, like you've talked. Do you, do, you, do you find that hard? Where you're kind of like seen as a gateway to mainstream radio play for a lot of kids and a lot of a lot of musicians and artists, and then you, you can only get as far as you, and you play them on your show, and then and then people would kind of look at you as uh, you know having a, a lot more influence over what they're mm. playing on breakfast. Sometimes I feel like that. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, 
Like literally, they are pissed off at Ben and Liam, but you're wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but I think most people know where my heart is. Mm-hmm. You know, me and what I've done for the yeah. culture and music, and and so if if something doesn't happen for them, they know it's not out of me trying to cop lock them. Mm-hmm. It's just like it's just not resonating further than my show. Yeah, um, which is uh, you know, I would love more hip hop. Yeah. Played outside of my show, yeah. But then you think about all the genres that are probably feeling the same way, yeah. And it's you've got to one. also imagine Richard Kingsmore listening to that demo you gave him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. I think a lot of people uh, kind of un- underestimate how much music we get as yeah. well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and for them, like for me, it's just hip hop. Mm. But for them, for the everyone outside of the hip hop show, it's like hip hop rock. Yeah. Heavy like punk mm-hmm. dance. The thirteen different versions of Ocean Alley that yeah, have popped up exactly in the last right. four months. You know, so you know, <laughs> you got you to give them a break. You know, anything hip hop, yeah, yeah, you know, at me. I'm mean, yet to see Cursor face to face since then. Right, it'll be good just to have a com- like a proper conversation about why he feels a certain way. Because I always thought we were cool, and then obviously he feels differently do you feel like the beef is maybe getting less intense though across the scene because everyone's making money now it's it's because the scene is so small mm. and you're bound to run into someone yeah you know what i mean and if if it was like true beef then it will get handled like mm. because when you see them it'll something will happen so i you know i, I think people are just kind of be wary of that mm. um and you know what have we got to complain about, really? You know, everyone's everyone has an opportunity to succeed, and it is the most multicultural kind of genre in Australia. I guess we were saying with the hooligan hefts and and uh, you know you guys in one four and now chilling it mm-hmm. like every kind of um, you know the, everyone's represented. Yeah, what, what are you seeing with that the, that particular sound? Uh, the, chilling it. Do you think feel like that's going to be the next big thing? Yeah, kind of. It's. I mean, obviously, he's the hardest artist yeah. at the moment. He'd be one of the biggest in Australia. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Yeah. You know, he's I think he's um, probably the most open about his love of a bamboo schooner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think he was, you know, more streams in. Well, I don't know who's just went number one, so I don't know. But I think, yeah, he's definitely the hardest thing. You know, harder than. Probably Cursor, he's probably hotter than the Hoods. You know, especially with the young generation. Anyway. Yeah. Well, but like, even is probably hotter than. Missy Higgins, Courtney Barnett, oh, yeah, like yeah, 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's amazing to see, mm. you know, the last what year when he came back to rapping, and then from then it just blew up. But you know, it's not only the music. You know, he's very charismatic. You know, he's awesome on socials, and that's all the things that you have to take in consideration. Hip hop in Australia's never really had a sex icon. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, apart from a young Howie, of course. Oh, of course. You know, before I got married, you know, I was out there. Nah. Um, and DJ Debris. <laughs> <laughs> He was a hot piece of ass back in the day, wasn't he? Sex icon. Briggs, yeah. Briggs, you know? Yeah, you know, slimming down, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, it's looking good these days. Um, but yeah, and he's just that lovable chap, you mm. know? The one that the girls want to be with, the one the guys want to hang out with. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and you know, he's about to do his tour, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the next release will be like. Yeah. You know, because I feel that the first one was just kind of, it was a mishmash of what he was doing, but it seems to be he's focusing on creating like a proper body of work. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. Uh, well, we've got a few gutter rappers in um, in Batuta. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah a, a burgeoning scene, bustling scene out <laughs> yeah, here. But it'll be a cold day in hell if, if either Ben or... All Liam goes, goes, whoa, language warning. Here's the biggest rap sensation out of Batuta. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you reckon would be the, the first hardest export out of Batuta? Yeah. The be- first artist? Yeah. Like uh, the- MC Stanley. Uh, Stanley? Yeah, yeah, there's uh, Bumbag and yeah. Stanley. They're two popular... Um, <laughs> Popular. Is he named after like the night. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, I think he's involved. They're pretty in... hard. Both yeah. of their dads are lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> and they went to a private school. <laughs> yeah. yeah, real Blues and Esso vibes. But they're um, they're, they're going to, um, our you know, there's a scenes popping off everywhere, and uh, we've got to thank you for coming in today, Howie. Yeah. Thanks I for this chit chat. It's an honor, like to like fair and square. It's an honor to come on the show, and you know, you guys. 
have provided the laughs for everyone for for a long, long time, especially for the Pacific Island community. So, you know, I, as a representative of the community, I thank you for the humor and, you know, some of my favorite articles from Batuta, the, um, the one where the guy was was given permission to say us that was <laughs> yeah. up there and the laughing emoji one I yeah. think is well, right up there as well well the Polynesian community are pioneers of the laughy cry emoji <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. No, it's, um, yeah no it's uh, again Batuta multicultural part of the world and we have <laughs> we have a big Pacific Islander community as well so and that, that all comes through in the writing but um you know, we'll show you around the place now. Actually, now that we've um, oh, yeah, now we've finished the interview, yeah. let's let's go have a look, and uh, maybe we can do a little bit of a cipher later on. We won't record it or anything. Yeah. We'll <laughs> keep it locked. It's not the NRL. We'll keep these videos <laughs> locked down. Thanks, Hal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, mate. And that was our interview with Hal Lada Kefu. There's a lot going on in his world, a lot going on in the Australian music scene in general. So uh, we look forward to another prosperous year for those uh, in the makeshift recording studios around the country uh you're doing it for the culture congratulations and good luck my name's clancy overall uh this is the batuta advocate radio show thanks for tuning in you be kind to each other and my name is errol parker until next week never talk to the cops they're not your friends and always talk to them if you have a lawyer present only and of course say to the pokies <laughs>